I'm going to talk about Swift and media storage. Um, I wasn't quite sure what the technical level of the audience was, so uh, my first few things talk about what do I mean by media storage. Um, do all of you know the answer to that question? No. 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 Great. OK. What, is, what does it mean in your context? Um, so media storage, in my context, means all of the all of the images, all of the other types of media, movies, sounds, and, and so on, for all of the wikis, not just commons. Uh, though I have some statistics on commons here because it's uh, the largest by uh, a lot. I think the second largest is about 10% its size. So um, about 15 million objects in uh, uh, 15 million of the, the original objects. So by originals, I'm talking about when you look at a uh, commons file page and you, you get a, a picture, the link to the original is actually buried down here. This is um, a scaled version. But that's what I mean when I'm talking about original media. Uh, in addition to all of the original media, there are all the scaled versions. Uh, we call them the thumbnails. These are the ones that you actually embed in wiki pages. Um, there are about 78 million of those. And, and this is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, so by Media, I mean the combination of those things. Uh, those are stored separately from all of the text. Uh, obviously, they, they have a very different profile. They're much larger. Uh, they're all binary. Um, and the, uh, because we encourage people to upload things to commons through things like uh, Wiki Loves Monuments and, and uh, you know, centralizing all of the media, uh, the amount of storage just keeps growing. And we keep them all, so it's never getting smaller. Um, right now, we're at about uh, 25 terabytes of original storage. That's not counting any of the scaled media. Um, and it's growing at, uh, over the past year about 10 terabytes. So it's a lot of stuff. Um, so what, what we would like to have from the system that stores all this media is something that uh, can grow, that that's, has a large capacity and can keep growing. Uh, right now we're at 25 terabytes. We'd like to be 50 or 100 so that uh, we can have more Wikiloves monuments and Wikiloves whatever else we can come up with. Um, we also want to encourage donations of public domain images, uh, uploads from, uh, for example, the uh, National Archives uh, uploaded uh, a collection of pictures that Ansel Adams took on a federal grant uh, from all of the national parks, which are totally awesome, and previously were hidden in some vault somewhere. So we want to encourage those types of uploads. Obviously, they use a lot of space. Uh, we want the system storing this media to handle uh, physical machine failure. Um, we want to make sure that we can pull power, pull power on a machine, that a switch can die, that uh, anything can happen in our data center, and the service continues. Uh, it doesn't need to support incredibly high throughput or incredibly high latency. Because the, uh, all of the images served on all pages uh, come from a, uh, a layer of cache before they hit the actual storer. Um, it, it's not as important that it be incredibly fast. It's still a good thing, but it's not as important as the capacity and the fault tolerance. Uh, now, I know some other talks have talked about cache, and uh, I'm not sure if it's come up, but logged in users generally bypass the page cache. That's not true with images. Logged in users get to hit that cache as well. So uh, still speedy. I think uh, the cache catches somewhere between 95 and 99% of all image requests. So Swift is a project from uh, OpenStack. OpenStack uh, has a open source uh, virtualization engine, uh, what Ryan is using in labs. Uh, you'll probably hear more about that later. Um, uh, they, in addition to the virtualization uh, engine, have uh, a storage engine. Um, this is similar to Amazon's S3, uh, API compatible. Um, the interesting parts about it, uh, it is, in fact, a buzzword compliant, scalable fault tolerant object store. So it's scalable in that as you add machines to the cluster, uh, 
to increase the amount of storage, the capacity, uh, and to increase the amount of throughput, it does not change the latency. So you can grow bigger, and it still takes the same amount of time to access stuff. Um, you can grow bigger by adding more machines of the same type, rather than needing to buy bigger machines. Uh, it's fault tolerant in the, uh, in the design and in the architecture of the system. Uh, every component is, has more than one copy, and uh, there's no single point of failure within it. The interesting thing that's different from how most MediaWiki installations hold their files is that it's an object store, not a file system. It holds complete objects, so you upload a whole image, and you can fetch the whole image, uh, unlike a, a file system in which you ask for uh, a specific range of, of bytes off the disk, and you can do things like seek to different areas, uh, which are advantageous for uh, things like databases, but given the access uh, the access type for media, uh, object store is a perfectly valid way of representing this stuff. The Swift architecture is broken out into four main server processes. Uh, the proxy server is the front, it accepts all incoming <coughs> traffic. So any request first hits the proxy server. Um, the proxy server then talks to the account server to authenticate a request if it has authentication tokens. Um, talks to the container server if it needs to get a listing of objects, uh, a listing of files. For example, when uh, you do a, a, a purge, an image purge, uh, it needs to find a list of all of the thumbnails in order to delete them. Um, or the object server in order to actually fetch an object. One of the interesting uh, things that, that's different about Swift than a file system uh, because it's an, an object store, you don't actually need to get a listing of what's there in order to get the thing itself. So if you're asking just for a single image, uh, you don't actually need to talk to the container server at all. And if uh, the request is already authenticated uh, and cached, you don't need to talk to the account server either. So uh, most, of the, most of the requests that come through here talk to the proxy server and the object server, and that's it. We've grouped these servers into two machine types. Um, I should mention, in, in addition to uh, these four main servers, uh, server processes, there are a, a number of background processes that are not uh, involved in real-time requests, but are responsible for keeping integrity within the cluster, um, taking care of uh, failed nodes, uh, moving data around as you increase the size, and so on. So we've grouped them into two different machine types. Uh, the proxy server is on its own um, because it's handling uh, all of the front-end requests, the, the, uh, the type of server it needs to be is, is quite different. It doesn't have any local storage besides in-memory storage. So it has a, a local memcache for uh, caching things like uh, account validation tokens. But um, it doesn't have any, anything on disk except the OS and, and so on. The container server, account server, and object server are all processes that store stuff on disk. So we've grouped them all into the uh, back-end storage server. Uh, the proxy is the front-end server. Um, other characteristics that are slightly different, uh, the proxy server is more CPU-bound, needs less memory, uh, so we're, we can tune the, uh, the hardware a little bit more that way. What does that mean they're grouped together? Uh, so I, I mean that these three processes yeah. are all running on the same machine. This process is running on a different machine. Yeah. Um, the two machine types, uh, if you're interested, they're both uh, six core uh, dual CPU machines. Um, you can see uh, significantly different amounts of RAM and uh, significantly different types of disks. Um, these guys are, are RAID 1 because it's uh, just the OS and um, we like them not to crash. Uh, Swift interacts with each disk on its own rather than using a RAID system. So RAID traditionally is, is what you use in order to keep multiple copies of something. So if one disk dies, uh, it has a copy somewhere else. Swift manages that replication. It keeps three copies instead of two. Uh, and it makes sure that they're stored on different servers in, in different areas. Uh, so it, uh, it doesn't need RAID. If one of the disks fails, uh, that's OK. Question? Yes. 
Uh, yes. Yes. The the twelve SATA disks are the two SSDs are not. And failure is detected and new copies are created when a disk dies or. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, f the the failure is detected and uh, there's a you need to adjust the the rings that I'll I'll get into in a little bit in order to move the data somewhere else. Um, in the meantime. Uh, one of the uh, one of the requests will uh, return an error and it will fetch it from another location. Yeah. At the start, you mentioned that your your total um, amount of stuff you have stored is about twenty four tera, uh, and I'm looking at twelve times two terabytes. Are, are these basically each a full copy of everything that you have? No. Per server. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, okay. So um, I mentioned that the, the backend servers have two different types of disks, SSDs and, and uh, large SATA drives. Um, the container server and the object server, even though they're accessed less frequently, uh, it's much more important that you get a, very, an, a response very quickly. Um, they have a little bit more work to do. The container server has a, a database that it maintains uh, for each container that uh, uh, maintains a list of, of what's in there so that it can be fetched quickly, but even that is much uh, a much more difficult operation than just fetching an object off the disk. So uh, the objects uh, generally have um, between, uh, point, uh, between 100 and 300 milliseconds uh, fetch time. The container servers, we want to be uh, faster than that. So we've segregated off storage for the container servers and the account server onto the fast disks um, so that uh, those operations are, are quick. Uh, you're asking about um, if, each disk, if each machine is a, a full copy. So the front end, the, uh, each of these processes can be duplicated as many times as you like. Um, the, our, our cluster has five of the front ends, 12 of the back ends. Um, Swift wants to keep three copies of everything it stores. Uh, that is configurable. We set it to three. Um, but with 12 backend nodes, three copies each, uh, only three of those 12 machines are going to have a specific object. So in order to maintain that mapping of uh, which objects live where, uh, there's a uh, what they call a ring file. Um, there's a a method uh, used in caches, uh, a consistent, uh, consistent hash, where you can uh, you set up initially a uh, collection of many, many, many buckets. Uh, in this case, it's uh, two to the sixteenth, I think. Um, and distribute those amongst different machines, so that when a request comes in, it can do a mathematical operation in order to figure out which machine has that data. Um, that means that you don't need to keep a live update of which machines have what data, which means there's, uh, you don't need to centralize that information. You don't need to have a conversation about uh, where data li lives. You can figure that out by running a mathematical operation on any one of these servers. Um, so amongst these 12, uh, all, all of the machines know for a given object which servers it's on. So that means when a request comes into the proxy server, it can go and ask uh, the backend number six directly without having to do any no negotiation to figure out where that object is. Makes it nice and fast. Um, so along the, the same lines you were asking about uh, what happens when a device fails. The allocation of these shards to an individual machine uh, is maintained by a static set of files. You can uh, use a, a background process to adjust these files and say, you know, this piece of data is actually supposed to be over there. You distribute those files to all of the servers, uh, and it doesn't have to happen uh, a, in a synchronous manner. Um, one of the background processes that's running around here that I was talking about earlier uh, will look at those files, and it's just constantly looking at all of the files on the machine and says, OK, for this file, let me look at the, at the rings and find out if it's in the right place. Am I supposed to have it? Cool. Let me ask the other two copies if they both have a good copy. They have it? Cool. Oh, one of them doesn't? 
I'm going to send a copy over there. So all the time in the background, if something, if something fails, uh, it's continually just checking things and we'll move it over there. Now that obviously doesn't happen real time, uh, so if a, if a drive drops out, there will be a period of time in which there are only two copies instead of three. Um, that's sort of okay. Uh, after you make one of these adjustments and say uh, add two new servers, it'll be a little while before all of the data moves over there. Uh, during that time though, you still do have three copies uh, because these background servers are both checking that their peers have it and that they have it. So if you bring on two new servers and move a bunch of stuff over, one of those peers will say, oh, I'm, I'm actually not supposed to have this anymore. Uh, that guy over there is. So I'm going to send him a copy and then I'll delete my own. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I was building a mental picture when you were describing things. And it looks like the background processes live on each server inside the 12 storage ring. That's, That's right. <laughs> okay, and so they're actually each servicing one request from some user somewhere out there? Uh, the background processes are not serving user requests. The object server, the account server, and container server, those, these three processes are the background servers are also running on this machine. The background processes are also running on this machine, but doing non-real-time tasks, such as uh, the the uh, checking to see whether everything's correct. Okay, but you referred to the ring, which appears to be the three things container object account. Uh, the ring is uh, wh when I I'm sorry, when I say the ring, I mean the uh, the data file that contains the mapping of what object is supposed to go where. And it's actually just a collection of uh, math, uh, mathematical formulas and uh, some seed values. So it doesn't actually list a specific object, but given an object's name, that hashes to a specific value, which then lands on a specific server. I'm sorry, where is the ring? Is uh, the ring is uh, a collection of uh, three files, one for each, and a copy resides on every server. Um, so I haven't looked at uh, the, the math that, that it actually runs, uh, but when you ask the ring for where an object is, it spits out three values, not one. Uh, and it takes care of making sure that they're evenly distributed across the machines. And this holds true even when you add new servers? So yeah, when you add new servers, it recalculates, it, it, uh, recalculates the ring in order to uh, move data to those new servers. And one of the constraints about how it does that recalculation is that it only moves one copy at a time. So when you add new servers, it actually will take a little while to fully populate them because you want to add them to the rings, tell it to move stuff around, and then wait a couple of days or a week, uh, and then say, okay, move stuff around a little bit more because there's a lot of space there. And uh, I know you only moved one copy earlier. Now maybe you know, a, a second copy can move somewhere else. Yeah? Uh, how long does it take to fill the new server? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it depends on how many you add at a time, um, how aggressively you ask it to fill. If you add a new server to the storage, how long until it is in normal use? Have yeah. Normal use um, my, so when uh, going from five to six servers, uh, it took about two weeks for it to fully fully equalize. Um, going from six to twelve, um, adding them much more slowly and just saying, okay, take uh, ten percent of the traffic and send it to the new machines, and then let that sit for a couple of days. Okay, now make now make it twenty percent uh, because we're not fighting capacity issues at the moment, so that. Uh, decreases the impact on the cluster. Um, clearly, if uh, you add a whole bunch of empty stuff and then say just you know populate them as quickly as possible, you're going to be running the disks pretty heavy in order to get data over there, uh, which will impact the performance of the cluster. So uh, we can control how fast that goes, and I've been keeping it pretty slow. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry to ask pretty much the same question again, uh, but I'm just trying to get my head around your, the way you're using. Sure. Um, just by my my rough you know, uh, numbers here, if, if you 
you're looking at 24 terabytes per server times 12 servers divided by three to, for redundancy, you're, you're still looking at 96 terabyte roughly. That's right. What I'm trying to get at is, um, or to try to understand is if you've got 24 terabytes of data and at the beginning of your, your thing you said, well, we want to be able to handle 50 or 100, where's, where's the extra disk space there? Is that free disk space that you guys are just have or... Yeah, so uh, 25 terabytes of original media, another uh, 12 or so of, of scaled media. Uh, so we're actually around, uh, what, 37, something like that. And um, the easiest answer to your question is each one of those disks is only about 15% full, 20% full. So we're using uh, about 37 out of the available 90-ish uh, um, and over the course of the next year, hopefully that'll get up to maybe 70, and then we'll add a few more and, and so on, yeah. So yes, it's just empty, empty space sitting on those disks. Okay, so, yes? There was a famous outage of the Amazon storage cloud where they had a serious kind of crash where um, it, get insta it became instable, because adding few servers caused a reorganization of the storage ring and then added load and then the, the disk was, the, the storage node was already overloaded and was took out of the ring and this oscillated through the storage at Amazon. Yes, I remember that one. You don't have this kind of fear for this kind of event. Um, I think that one was compounded by a number of factors. Uh, they had, um, cross-location replication going as well. And I, if I remember right, there was a, a split where um, both of them thought that they were the only one left and madly tried to create another one. Um, they have a, a number of automated processes managing the rings to, to try and make sure that when something happens, it starts making a new copy immediately. Uh, we don't have those at the moment. Um, I've been managing the rings by hand. Uh, that our cluster changes rarely enough that that's not an issue. Um, clearly, Amazon is at a, a whole other scale. I understand where that, where that problem comes from, um, and I, I don't have a fear that, that we'll see that same, same kind of thing. Uh, we do intend soon to start up a, uh, a cross-colo replication to a second SWIFT cluster, um, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of failure characteristics that has uh, and whether it could trigger a similar thing. Yeah. So that kind of begs the question, is there any chance for you to do this kind of system on AWS as opposed to doing your own? Um, so the interface, uh, I, I haven't gotten into the interface with MediaWiki yet, but um, the method of using Swift from within MediaWiki uh, is through the uh, file backend class, which uh, Aaron Schultz has been rewriting to have several submodules. So it can have a direct file class where it just talks to the file system. Uh, there's, it uses cloud files uh, to talk to Swift. Um, Ryan, it, is it right that cloud files is using the S3 API? I don't think so. I think it's okay. using the Nova, Nova, the, uh, Nova, Nova API. Swift API directly. Okay. Um, I think we're going to have an S3. Yeah, uh, so the, the idea is that uh, <coughs> it is modularized such that an S3 backend would be just as easy. Uh, and I, uh, at the hackathon in New Orleans last year, there was an employee from Microsoft working on an Azure backend. Um, so it's, it's now been modularized such that you can choose your storage uh, independently of how you're running MediaWiki. Um, this, I mean, it, it is essentially a, an open source version of how S3 works. So. Uh, the, the advantage of using something like S3 would, uh, wouldn't be um, technical, more likely either cost or ease of maintenance or something else. Uh, so, oh, convenient. Thank you for setting the stage. Um, how, how Swift is embedded in the, the MediaWiki stack. Um, I talked about everything uh, for the, the scaled media going through a nice big cache uh, before it gets to Swift. Um, it's only the things that fall through the cache that lands to land in Swift. So things that are likely to fall through the cache are uh, recently purged images. So when you, are, uh, when, you, when you purge thumbnails for an image, 
uh, it pops up a page saying, hey, you know, I'm done. That page itself includes two thumbnails. So those are going to be regenerated and will not be in the cache. Um, new, new uploads aren't going to be in the cache. Uh, uh, images that have not been accessed in a very long time uh, are not going to be in the cache. So Squid picks up most of it, hits the cache, falls through to uh, MediaWiki to uh, be generated if it doesn't exist, exist in Swift. Uh, the scaled media at, uh, is um, generated on demand. So when, uh, when you upload an image, it doesn't create thumbnails. Uh, it's only when you load the thumbnail page uh, or embed the thumbnail in something or use it uh, on some other website that uh, MediaWiki will generate the, the thumbnail. Uh, it then gets populated in Swift and Squid. Uh, original media, um, is you interact with via MediaWiki rather than uh, coming through the thumbnails. Um, and it was talking about the file backend class and the, the Swift module it uses cloud files, uh, which was a uh, which was produced by uh, Rackspace, um, who's the main sponsor of uh, OpenStack, in order to interact with Swift. Um, it's a PHP library that takes care of some of the, the uh, protocol to talk to Swift. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking questions uh, as we were going. Uh, that was useful. Uh, are there any other that have been lingering? Yeah, in the back. Um, there's a fairly well known DDoS against MediaWiki to basically just start harvesting thumbnails at arbitrary pixel sizes. Have you done try to do anything about that in this architecture? Um, I do not. So the question uh, there's a uh, well known denial of service against MediaWiki where you just sort of run through every thumbnail size and uh, overwhelm MediaWiki's ability to generate them on demand. Uh, this architecture does not address that problem. Um, one could argue that it's, it's not really the responsibility of the storage engine to try and protect itself from application level attacks, but... Uh, yeah, but some, somewhere in that client squid... Mm -hmm. right, yeah, so somewhere in that chain... Somewhere in this chain, because it hits Swift at, before it hits MediaWiki, uh, somewhere along there, you do need to, to implement that protection. Um, we'll need to handle that at the The way it's currently protected against is that there is a limited number of Apaches that scale images. Mm. There's only like four or five of them. So you take out those five machines. You now DDoS the cluster of five machines. Congratulations. But you can't generate any new thumbnails. You can't generate any new thumbnails. Yeah. It's still a problem, but you're not taking the site down. Right. It's, it's a problem that we have discussed. It's not, a, it's not a denial of service that's high impact right now. And it's not something that would affect uh, readership, but it would affect new file uploads. It would affect things like that. So we've discussed ways of handling it. And if we start having these problems, then we'll address it. We already have ideas for how to solve it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, saying, saying the same thing that Ryan said in, in a different way, this does take 95 to 99 percent of all hits. So, it, it uh, does if it's the same request that we made last time. Yeah, but most of the, the regular usage, right? So, the, the, the goal of a denial of service attack is to prevent other people from using your service. I can flush the square yeah. cache pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, through the yeah. API, that's true. With the curl. So, mm -hmm. so Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I was, I mean, just similar to what he said. Uh, I don't know, this architecture seems to be, is it uh, true to say that it's very reliant on the fact that the more, 95% or 99% of the requests are served out of the cache? What happens, you know, like, okay, if all of them result in like a cache mess? Mm -hmm. and that you fairly trivial to uh, do so, you know, by just just you know generating API requests as yeah. pointed out in how does script scale to that scenario? 
So uh, to rephrase your question, make sure I get it right, um, how, does, how does Swift scale as you increase the number of requests? That are cached, Yeah, but no so, so from Swift's perspective, uh, no cache means more requests to Swift. Yeah. So uh, the number, because the, the uh, Swift scales by increasing the number of front ends to handle more concurrent requests and increasing the number of back ends to distribute the load of requesting objects across more machines. Um, at the moment, there are only three copies of each object. Uh, so the proxy chooses one of the three back ends at random in order to request that object. So uh, three concurrent requests for an object will likely spread across three different machines. Uh, so basically, you have three times disk read speed uh, in order to serve a, s a specific object. Um, and as you increase the number of backend servers, the likelihood that one server is uh, serving multiple requests at the same time decreases. Uh, so to serve higher throughput across many different objects, uh, scaling the number of backends uh, distributes that load effectively. Um, to scale the number of requests for a specific object, uh, at the moment it's, it's fixed at three. Um, that is configurable, though uh, I think it would be a challenge to change uh, it expects that you, uh, you set the number of copies at the beginning and you don't change it, uh, though it is possible uh, with some more tricky manipulation of the ring files. So if we did need to serve uh, more copies of specific objects, we could increase the replica count to four, five, six. Uh, that would increase the cost of the storage because we're keeping the same object multiple times, but would also increase the, the capacity to serve multiple requests simultaneously. Um, that's a, the, sort of the wrong solution. It's a very expensive solution. Trying to figure out how to maintain the cache uh, is much cheaper and uh, more effective. So basically, without, without the front-end cache, for any of our services, we're dead. Like, that's, our, that's how we scale. Almost all of our hits go to the front-end. 98% 90, roughly yeah. for images, 95 to 98% for text, roughly around the same for bits. So if any of those caches all started resu resulting in cache misses, the site dies. Go ahead. Help me understand that flow chart a, bit, a little bit better, uh, uh, how the front layer generation works, who's talking to whom. So the client talks to the squid, the squid looks at the squid, and if the squid doesn't find the thumbnail object in the squid store, who talks to the media wiki? Uh, let, me, let me give you a, a much more complicated picture um, to actually expose the, uh, how, that, how that works. Um, no? Uh, what slide is that? 17. <laughs> OK. So uh, this has a little bit of stuff about DNS that we don't need to worry about. Comes into a load balancer, hits a squid. Uh, the squid actually has two levels of cache. Uh, is that true for upload? Yeah. Um, that's hidden here. Um, if the squid does not have the content, uh, it sends a request out through a load balancer. I, I left load balancer out of the, the Swift conversation, but you can assume there's load balancers in front of the proxies. Um, sends it into Swift. Uh, which checks to find out if it has it. If it doesn't have it, before it sends a 404 back to Squid, uh, it intercepts that 404 and sends a request down to uh, MediaWiki running on the Apache server. Um, the MediaWiki will actually fetch the original media in order to scale it. Um, and we're still in transition, but uh, that's uh, in this design fetches it from Swift, does the, uh, does the image generation, the thumbnail generation, sends that back through the same pipeline. So from Squid's perspective, Swift responded with a thumbnail. So we have the Squid, and we have the Swift proxy, and behind it, the object store. Yes. So also there's many layers of caching, or proxy, or whatever. Yes. Uh, when on, when a, a thumbnail doesn't exist, yeah. it goes through the Squid's uh, the proxy checks the object store, doesn't find it. The proxy intercepts the, uh, the request before sending back a failure, 
and sends out a, a sub request to generate the image. So the split proxy is actually also an Apache process? Uh, it's, a, uh, it, it's a Python WSGI server. Um, and there's a, a piece of middleware that we added into it. Uh, the, the design of, of each of the Swift services is a collection of different modules, uh, which makes it very easy for us to insert a module in there that says, on 404 for a thumbnail, go get it from Apache instead. Um, Apache takes care of writing it into Swift, so it, doesn't, it just needs to, to proxy the, the response. Yeah, one more, and uh, then we'll move on. The network between all these nodes is gigabit or 10 gig? Gig gigabit. Um, yep. Actually, so for almost, uh, for caching servers, because we have such a high cache rate, uh, we actually can go over one gig on our network. But for all of our backend servers, we, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say an average utilization is more like 100 meg. Um, and yeah, so. Should we just start? And so yeah, so yeah. perfect transition thing. to start the Ask yeah. the Operators talk. <laughs> Since we're all seeming vague to be yeah. um, one more One more bit about the, uh, the rewrite middleware for, for Swift. Um, in addition to handling the 404 and going out and fetching it, um, Swift's internal representation of uh, where it stores objects is this container plus file thing, which is very different from the URL that comes in. Uh, so the, the middleware in order to allow unauthenticated access to these objects uh, does a translation and authentication uh, within that module. Um, so. so it's also a container service? Or? Uh, no, for, for that it, uh, it just does a strict uh, string translation on the URL. Uh -huh. So an, an example upload URL contains the project, uh, the language, uh, the fact that it's a thumbnail, and then a two-character hash, um, and then the file name itself. So that's a pretty easy just string translation to the actual container name. Uh, there's one more bit in there uh, before going into the file why, name. Why does it have to handle authentication? I mean, of course, for uploading or purging or whatever. But those are relatively infrequent events. Can't you just bypass like the regular Swift part? Uh, uh, yes. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the regular read access is unauthenticated. Um, but there, uh, so for, for part of the transition from the previous method to this one, uh, Swift itself was writing generated thumbnails into its object store rather than MediaWiki writing them in. Uh, so it needed to authenticate against, against itself in order to be allowed to do that right. Uh, we can pull that part out now, um, that uh, that transition is complete and MediaWiki does, the, does all the rights. All right, so uh, peers, come on up. <laughs> Let's ask us operators some questions. All right, so can everyone hear me via the microphone? Awesome. Uh, hi, so welcome to Ask the Operators. Okay. Oh. <laughs> and, the, and the front row, too. Today, Just give them a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Today um, we wanted to answer all of your questions about running the site. As, well, okay, everyone except for Domas's questions. And yeah, so uh, we already had started. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can show you guys some, some pretty charts that we tend to use. Ask as many as you would like, Domas. All right. We're, well, here, here. Why don't We're here for you. All? all right, oh, yeah, that's a great start. I'm Rob. Uh, I'm the I'm the guy that does the on-site server stuff here in DC. So I live here and work on the servers. Uh, I'm Leslie. I'm the uh, network and systems engineer. So I do a lot with all the routing, and I also uh, suffer through a lot of pu puppet code. I'm Ryan. I'm the labs lead, um, and I do random things like HTTPS, part of the IPv6 stuff, and other random things <laughs> on the site. Deserve it. <laughs> uh, I'm Jeff. I'm, I do special projects, which for the most part means I support the fundraising infrastructure and folks, you know, the technical crew there. That was ironic. Oh. <laughs> so mean. I'm Ben. Uh, I've most recently been working on uh, Swift, um, and uh, I guess 
my focus is, is just individual projects like that. In the location? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm uh, in the San Francisco <coughs> office uh, with Ryan and Leslie. Uh, Jeff is in Massachusetts. Rob is here. How many locations do you have? For employees um, or servers? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly servers. So we have three data centers. We have one in Ash, uh, Ashburn, Virginia, which is going to be our primary data center. We have one in Tampa, Florida, which is our primary data center currently. Um, and we have a caching data center in um, Amsterdam. Actually, it's in Harlem. Mark gets very upset when we say Amsterdam. Uh, it's a suburb of Amsterdam. And we are soon to have a uh, small That's caching smart, center so. in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And we are always looking for new sites for caching centers, um, along with donations of servers. So if anyone has You're several racks, gear. network gear, and servers. That are new. That are new, sorry, because a lot of people try to donate like old Pentiums. And it's like, I, I really appreciate the old Pentium, but we can't run our, uh, our, our, our code on it. Um, we choose not to. We, we can't run our code on it. <laughs> what do you need? Um, so, what's our latest? So, uh, our, so our total number of servers? Is that the question? I think uh, 20, uh, 24 servers, um, all uh, two CPUs. Um, some of the servers can have as small as 16 gigs of memory. Others need at least 64. Um, uh, I think at least about half of them need to have SSDs, uh, just for speed of serving uh, for caches. Um, um, most of the servers need to be one gig. Uh, about half the servers need to have at least uh, four uh, gig connections or uh, a 10 gig connection. Um, so you don't need Spark? Huh? You don't need Spark? Yourself. No, no. I mean, like, we, we would love to have, you know, Fusion IO cards and all that, but that's, that's very, very expensive. So we can't, you know, <laughs> we, uh, we, we often do a cost benefit analysis, analysis right? Because we're do using donor money. So if we, like, there's a lot of stuff we'd really love to have. Like we'd love to have 256 gigs of RAM in every server, but since we don't really need it, we can't justify, you know, spending money on it. Though if anyone wants to give us a lot of Fusion IO cards, we totally would take them. Actually, we've been doing a lot of testing with Fusion IO yeah. and whatnot recently, and because of donor funds and it's expensive, and we're actually now moving towards not those cards, but more just solid SSDs of high performance. But we're recently, in the past couple months, really started to work on that. In fact, our DBA is, that's what he's been doing. We've kind of locked him away and made him deal on that and parser cash, so. Yeah, how about the Um, we uh, we, we try to standardize on uh, Juniper, just because you know when you have a mostly homogeneous uh, network, it's a lot easier. Um, Juniper also has an advantage of uh, with I know the new Cisco iOS has more of this, but with JunoScript, uh, you can interact with it in a slightly more automated way, which always makes us happy. Um, so yeah. And, uh, they, and Juniper is, uh, because of the way they built all of their routing tables for the actual edge routing, they deal with large numbers of routes really well, uh, including IPv6. There's some other routers that, you know, because IPv6 addresses are so long, like they have, you know, space for maybe a half million routes. But then an IPv6 route takes up eight times the space. And so all of a sudden, you've, you've run out of routing space and you start dropping packets because you don't know where to send them and we don't want that to happen. And, uh, and so Juniper handles that uh, pretty well. It's a different architecture. Uh, yeah? Uh, we do. Um, so for the GOIP lookup, um, <coughs> the, the way that it works is that we have, um, <coughs> the concept is that when you do a DNS resolution, that you're likely hitting a resolver that is geographically close to you. And from that, um, that request will then at some point come and hit our <coughs> DNS servers. Our DNS servers map the resolver that you're using to um, some kind of numbered hash, and then it hashes that to uh, a location and then gives you a DNS <coughs> address 
or an IP address based on that location. So if you're geographically close to Amsterdam, then you'll likely hit our Amsterdam data center. If you're, ge if you're geographically close to the United States, then you will hit that data center instead because you will get a different uh, IP address. Is it also being used for IPv6? Yes, it is also being used for IPv6. Didn't you used to have a special data center in Asia? We had one in South Korea uh, <coughs> donated by Yahoo a long time ago, but as time went on, those servers that they donated, it got to the point that they were so slow and hard to keep up that it was faster just to start routing that traffic to, to Amsterdam. So. Well, the U.S. actually. Or the U.S. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Well, depending on where they hit, but yeah, I guess mostly the yeah. U.S. So you have a Eurasian Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you, you deal with Puppet a lot. Yes. I'm actually in the middle of making a choice between Puppet and Chef. I'm just wondering um, if you could speak to why you guys went with Puppet and what the advantages and drawbacks are. <coughs> So we started using Puppet, I, I think, before Chef was released. Um, so we already had a decent amount of Puppet code and didn't really see much advantage to switching to Chef. They're both written in Ruby. You both have to deal with that. And if, if you prefer not to use Ruby, there's not a main differentiator between the two. Um, now, there's holy wars between the two, right? So we're not going to go so much into that. We're, we're um, fairly deeply heavily invested in Puppet right now. It would take a lot for us to switch over, and that's really the main motivator of why we're using Pup Puppet over Chef. Um, <clears throat> if, if you prefer other languages than, than Ruby, there's other alternatives that you should probably look at as well, like SaltStack, for instance. Uh, there's a number of Python ones that are up and coming that actually look like viable alternatives. Um, but as long as you're using something along those lines, it doesn't really matter. Oh, does everyone know what Puppet is? Or raise your hands if you want us to, to just explain what it is. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, you know, uh, we have hundreds of servers and in all different classes. And if we had to set up each of those servers by hand, we would get nothing else done and want to kill ourselves. So Puppet's an automated configuration language that we have a file that basically maps a server name to a, to a class of server. And so, you know, it, so the server talks to the Puppet Master and says, hey, I'm this server. Puppet Master says, all right, you're that server. Download these 10 files and these 20 packages and install them. And uh, it's a way that we also can keep all of our servers up to date. Like when we have a new configuration file, all we have to do is update it in one place. And uh, every server has a cron job that every hour it talks to the Puppet Master and pulls down any, uh, any new servers. It checks the uh, MD5 of uh, all the files that it's supposed to be keeping track of. And if it sees there's a newer version, it'll pull that down. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very helpful tool with its own quirks. Yeah. Uh, how many servers of a different role do you need to start to uh, configure and then you can pop it? So you, if, you, if you have a what? server that only does one specific yeah. thing, you yeah. always pop it? <coughs> pop it? I, mm -hmm. You should, you, in, in my opinion, you should use configuration management for everything. If anywhere, any, if you're starting an infrastructure, you should start it off doing configuration management. You'll save yourself time every single time. Yeah, and you know, then, because one day your server's gonna die, your hard drive's gonna die, right? And you don't wanna have to remember how you set it up, you know, all the time. It's so much easier if you can just then put in a new server and it's done. Thomas, your hand is blocking everyone behind you, man. You gotta put it down. I, I've been eagerly awaiting your question. Please, <laughs> would you let us know? What, what amount of CPU power does it take to manage configuration compared to the serving the website? Way more than it should. Way, <laughs> way more than it should. How, how much CPU, uh, how, how much uh, resources does it take to run the configuration management? Um, we, in, in my opinion, Puppet is fairly inefficient at this. Um, yeah. 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 It's, run our it's, yeah. Run our mem it's run our servers out of memory. It's run our servers out of memory. We've moved our Puppet to. server to four different servers over time, slowly increasing <laughs> the amount of hardware and memory we throw at it. It's a 16 core server, and it's still CPU bound. But to be clear, though, what, what, what they're describing clients. is the uh, oh. the Puppet uh. Master. Uh, yeah. I think 
you unless you're asking more about on, on each client. Yeah. Um, oh, no, I, I'm also I'm also talking about the client. The client has run our our servers out of memory, and have eaten up ridiculous amounts of CPU. It's absurd how inefficient these things are. How is that possible? Then? All has to do is some hashing and well, you would think so. That's what it we does, yell at our ops it, it every two weeks. Everyone asks that. that exact same question. It's, Ruby. This is why it's a major problem. The only configuration systems that are good right now are written in Ruby. It is part of the problem. Ruby in itself is slightly inefficient, but it's more than just that. It's also that the code itself is really not very efficient, and I don't think a lot of effort is being put into making it more efficient. Well, they have done it. It was written stable, by so. a Ruby programmer. <laughs> well, entirely. It was written by a Ruby programmer. It's the same, way, it's the same uh. reason why Java programs are always so... Ah. Well, that, that, then we're getting, now we're getting As into the this is, Vim this versus is, Emacs, this okay? Is, yeah, this is holy wars here. It's, it's, yeah. not, it's not Ruby versus anything else. It's, it's the fact that the code itself is not written very efficiently in, in certain cases, and especially in certain ways that we're using it. Part of the problem is also in the way that we're using it. Certain, there's certain things that you can do in Puppet that are known to be inefficient, then maybe they should be made more efficient, but at the same time, we could be avoiding those things as well. So It does make our life easier, though. Yes. What's your view on Juju and the new administrative tools? Uh, he's asking, how do I feel about Juju and the new canonical tools? Um, you're asking me that on camera, aren't you? <laughs> um, I think it doesn't fit our use case very well. Um, Juju is, uh, it's a main intent is for orchestration, and it's meant for cloud services directly. So for things like OpenStack, it's useful especially for end users of something like um, Amazon EC2, Rackspace Cloud, these kinds of things where um, you want to bring up an entire infrastructure and then maybe you want to kill it afterwards. And so the, the thing that Juju will do over something like Puppet or Chef or SaltStack or something along those lines is it will talk to the Amazon services, it'll create your virtual machine, it will inject things using Cloud Init, which tells the system to build itself in a certain way, connect to the Juju its server, and then also run all of the stuff from Juju in resulting in a full system, and then it will also allow you to connect the systems together in some kind of way. So you can say, I'm going to build a Hadoop cluster, <clears throat> launch all the virtual machines, make them build, and then configure it so that they're actually talking to each other in the right way. So it's useful on the initial build of the systems, but the design of Juju doesn't really make it very easy to make changes. And I feel that the majority of operating systems or uh, operations engineers' work is making changes to an existing infrastructure and not building a brand new infrastructure from scratch. Um, so I think for our use case, it doesn't fit what we're trying to do very well. But I, I think it is a good product, and that maybe in the future it's something that we can look at. But I think there's some other alternatives to, to Puppet I would rather explore than Juju. Salt stack. It's written in Python. The majority of the work that we do is in Python. It has remote execution that's built in. Um, Puppet also has the ability to remote execution if you integrate um, mCollective. Chef has something for remote execution, and there's a number of other remote execution things involved, but the integration between uh, Salt's configuration management states plus its ability to do remote execution and its ability to have peer interactions um, makes it kind of more powerful. So um, Salt also has some kind of abilities of Juju to make systems configure each other and things like this as well. So there's uh, alternatives like that I would rather pursue at this point in time than, than Juju. If I understand you right, it sounds like Juju is good for testing. Um, <clears throat> I, I think Juju is, is good for, for people that want to build new infrastructure quickly. And it, you can still do integration with Puppet and things like that after using Juju. It's, it's probably very good for people that want to do like auto scaling and, and things like that. So in, in cloud services, generally you get charged by the hour for how long your instances run. So you want to configure things to run and in, in, peak, in your peaks and valleys. So when you have a lot of traffic, you'll want to launch a ton of virtual machines, have them auto-configured and added into your cluster, and then when your traffic starts falling down, you start killing the virtual machines off. And so it's powerful from that point of view. 
Um, and for people that are initially launching in cloud environments, I think that's very powerful. Um, we're at a point where we're not going to be using cloud services. Um, we don't really do auto scaling. And if we did, it would be more along the lines of, we're now in a valley, let's turn hardware systems off to save power, more than um, launching virtual machines and killing virtual machines. Talk a question about cloud. Yes, sir. So back in the day, the Wikipedia was supposed to be open, easy to fork and so on, so to build infrastructure, everything was open source and so on. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, people, when they build something, they build on cloud. So how difficult would, be, would it be to build Wikipedia on cloud and what changes <coughs> the architecture would be like, would you want to make for that? So Domas, I love your question. Thank you very much for asking it. Um, we are using cloud services for some things and... No, no Wikipedia for <coughs> cloud. So I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way. So um, yes, in, in the past we had, um, we, our infrastructure was built solely by volunteers, which is awesome. Now it's built generally by staff. So if you would like to come to my talk at two o'clock roughly today, um, I, I, we're, we have a project called Wikimedia Labs, which is a cloud-based environment where you can build your own infrastructure. You can take your changes from this infrastructure push them into code review, and then have that change brought into production, which allows non-staff to make production level changes. So to further answer your question. Um, I'm asking about Wikipedia, not about cloud. I know. So I don't think it would necessarily um, be in our best interest to build Wikipedia in this cloud-like way. Um, a lot of things uh, that we're doing um, just don't fit the virtualization model very well. Um, maybe things like our Apaches could be done in a virtualized way rather than being done uh, strictly in hardware like we're doing right now, and we could do auto scaling with that. Um, but things like the squids and the varnishes, virtualization takes an IO hit. For those, we might be able to use containers, but um, not strictly virtualization since it's just overhead. Um, similarly, the, the databases, virtualization for that would be a horrible idea. Um, and a number of the other services that we have are more um, IO bound than other things. So adding on a layer of virtualization would actually ha in, in impact us in the performance side of things. And even, the, even though the impact would probably only be five to 10%, five to 10% is more than enough to actually ignore virtualization's slight benefits. Does that answer your question? No. Yeah, it would also cost a fortune. For, oh, you, to run it all on, on oh, do you, did you mean to run it all on, on uh, I mean, you know, remote sites? If someone wants to make a fork of Wikipedia, would you have to have like different data architecture or different? Oh, so you mean like running, uh, launching our entire, oh, you, you're you yeah. saying if someone wants to fork our projects yeah. and run it on a completely different site. So um, that's, partly doable right now using our Puppet Manifests. Um, you would have to have the same infrastructure and also our Puppet Manifests kind of suck right now, so it's not, it's not wonderful. It would be doable, but not easy. You would also have to own the same IP address ranges and same host names. Well, currently with the Puppet infrastructure, but it can be changed and we're eventually going to get to that point. But you would have to have a very similar architecture. In order, it depends on how much traffic you want to have. Yeah. Or you could open a Wikia site. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, since I'm talking anyway, I have a question. Um, what are your current or future plans about hip hop and what song about So I think we're waiting on hip hop uh, VM. Uh, Rabla, you want to stand oh. up? Yes, Rabla is the perfect person for this.
Oh. So, yeah, go. No, no, no. Um, hip hop is, um, <clears throat> the, the original hip hop was something that converted PHP into C++ code. And then that was compiled and would run things through the compiled version of your application rather than interpreting it through PHP every single time. Um, Hip Hop VM is uh, basically the same thing, except it's a just-in-time compiled version of that. So in, instead of having to recompile the entire application every single time you want to make a small change, you um, run your code base like you would, and it compiles it as it runs. Making it faster. We're slowly moving to Varnish over time. Yeah, like right now, our entire bits cache runs on Varnish rather than Squid. Mark, who isn't here, handles that. He's been around for longer than anyone else at the table. And um, he's dedicated working on that. So we're slowly moving to Varnish. I know Wikia used it well before we did, but they went through a lot of growing pains from it, so we held off for a while. But we're slowly going to phase out Squid. Uh, right now, a If large Mark's newest test works, no, it'll be oh, great, because yeah. he's just started doing some stuff with like a persistent hash back end and varnish mm -hmm. and making it work, but yeah. it's, uh, my understanding is, is we just haven't gotten varnish to work as reliably with the cluster interfacing uh, with MediaWiki well, that we There work. are certain features that we're yeah. missing from With varnish. Um, okay. large streaming, like very large files, uh, so the reason we, uh, it sometimes uh, it can have timeout issues. So uh, Mark just wrote a bunch of code to basically uh, make uh, streaming varnish services work <coughs> so that, you know, because uh, as, as the future moves forward, video is more and more popular and we're assuming and hoping that it'll become more and more popular to have video uploads and comments, but uh, we have to wait to start serving those out of varnish, mm -hmm. but hopefully we'll be able to soon. Mm -hmm. Um, like yeah, that's or that's handleable VCL. in VCL. Okay. And, well, and did, did Varnish fix the bug where if the backhands go away for one second, the load gets compiled? Well, so, oh, you mean the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to look into that. That's the, the packet loss issue, right? Yeah, I don't think it's happened yet since. The, the Varnish should have a bug where if it lost its network connection for a Small amount of time, like a second. If if it if it went if the interface physically went down and up, it didn't experience this. So, you, but if it if the network went away, like there was a <coughs> farther upstream issue, it uh, would the load would spiral uncontrollably, um, which could be solved by restarting Varnish, uh, assuming that the CLI was responsive. Uh, if not, it was restarted by pull it, turning it off and on again, <laughs> uh, the whole machine. Uh, Usually we manage to get to it by the CLI. Uh, and I don't think we've actually had a network issue where we could have re-experienced that bug. Uh, Asher was looking at it. I think he I figured it while. out, but it's, yeah, I Asher's not here. Been a while. There was a time, like maybe this time last year or something, where like every month or so, like there would be like a few seconds of packet loss in ESAMs, and then all the ESAM bits Yeah. And this would happen like every few weeks. But it's tough. So yeah. that well, might be because Varnish fixed it or it might be because we have more reliable networks fixed it. I, fixed it as well. I think both. <laughs> but when we started using bit Varnish was uh, really fun and everybody loved bits being down. <laughs> yeah. Bits is the CSS is it or CSS JavaScript server. So uh if you if you, you know, you go to the page and it looks horrific. That's probably because our bits cache is down. <laughs> we do consider that an outage because, you know, it, the page is it's technically usable without CSS, but it's it's not very usable without the CSS. <laughs> yeah. Is this the right place to ask it? I'm not sure where it's talking with, but as a user, sometimes I'll get people saying your wait is going to be 600 seconds before it's catch up. 
Oh. Hi. Oh, the error messages. <coughs> uh, you're, you're talking about just database lag in, in general? Just database lag. Well, I mean, um, what specifically I think about it? Shows it shows up in some error messages. It actually shows up in yeah. some media that you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's not well, it, it is. Uh, so ideally, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and when it does, you should report it on um, on IRC channels if you can. Because there are people, you know, they say this is like 24 hours. This is like a week. Oh, is this two server lag maybe? I don't know. Like site, uh, actually on the site. Oh, it's been 24 hours. hours. Yeah, if, if you've, if you, definitely if you see any error messages like that, um, come in, uh, there's, uh, you know, several channels. Uh, the operations folks always hang out in Wikimedia-operations. Um, and then there's Wikimedia-tech as well, which is another channel that all the people hang out in. Um, and often if you go to pound Wikimedia or pound Wikipedia or pound Wikimedia Wiki, someone there will send you to the correct channel if you. Two types of database lag. One is the So there's, there's a number of channels, there, there's a number of ways that you can report this kind of thing. Um, we have mailing lists, there's a wikitech-l mailing list that you can report it on, you can report it via Bugzilla, you can report it via IRC, and um, sometimes it could be the case that we just haven't been notified that there's database lag. And when that occurs, we'll go and we'll look at the problem, we'll try to solve it as fast as possible. Well, actually, do you want to bring up Nagios? Um, well, status.wikimedia.org is probably the, okay. the, the thing that we point users at. Oh, well, I was just going to show them what we use. Oh, okay. So we, we do have a, an automatic uh, detection and alerting system called Nagios. Um, yeah, if you look it up, we're, we're actually uh, switching. Is it actually not Nagios on the screen? No. Oh, yeah, that, 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 this, this is status. Is, that, yeah. that, is a, that is a very great um, also way to know if, if there are any major issues, and it looks much nicer. No, no, this is a uh, watch mouse. Okay. Sorry, the name of the this is status that Wikimedia at org. Huh? I'm sorry. Oh, they did. Oh, I have no But idea. you can still go to watchmouse.org, and it gets there. Um, yeah, it's watch mouse is a external service which uh, monitors and uh, looks at the status of the site. Um, you always want some sort of external service in case your network is all sorts of crazy messed up. Um, you want, you know, it's more likely that some external service will be like what the users see. And so this is Nagios. Um, you can see it has lot, lots of alerts. Um, and a terrible interface. A terrible interface, yeah. <laughs> uh, it notifies us on IRC, um, and for some specific things, it actually, uh, SMSs all of our cell phones, um, and uh, so if it's oh, there, there's always a lot of things, yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, <laughs> we we have we have higher alerts for things that are really problematic. Yeah, on IRC we'll, channels. IRC. Oh, that's that's one of the ways. The community is definitely a very, um, very good way of getting notifications. But for certain high-level things, we get pages on our cell phones via SMS. Um, we'll get emails for certain things. Um, other things, even though they they're listed as critical, they're critical from the point of view um, like we need to fix it. It's a problem, but it's not necessarily something that is causing the site to be down. Yeah. If you see the little, there's a little person icon and a little sleep icon, that means uh, someone has acknowledged that they are working on it. Um, Do any of you remember the URL for VBTree? 
It's Not just go to notwikimedia.org and there's links through that. <clears throat> Like some of these things are actually known. Like SSL three thousand four has a hardware outage, but it's in a cluster that has twelve systems. So it being and down, the system being down is critical, but it's not causing the service to go, to actually be down. So if the service went down, we get paged. But for the uh, the individual server going down, we don't. You just have to scroll. It's way over. Oh. Yeah. I'm not used to this being this small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so you're asking about uh, DB replication lag. Um, this is one of the tools that shows all of our databases and uh, the lag in each one. So for most of them, you'll see lag zero, lag one. Uh, this is for S1, the shard one. The, the, uh, the wiki content uh, is split up into seven different shards. Um, EN wiki is, the English wiki is on its own. Um, uh, I don't remember any of the other groupings, but uh, basically we, we take uh, a, a smaller collection of, of language wikis and put them together and then all, uh, all of the languages that have very few articles we can put on the same, same machines. Uh, each one of those is a different shard. Um, so for S1, lag is looking pretty good across the board. A lag of one doesn't really mean anything. Second. The difference between two integers, so. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so to my understanding, there's a plan for the foundation to eventually support uh, wiki data. Do you see any obstacles from that from, a, from an operations perspective? We haven't. Yes. <laughs> we, have, we haven't really gotten. <laughs> so we haven't really gotten their right. any performance data, and we haven't gotten any, um, you know, requirements and testing or. Well, so that's not. That's not technically oh. correct. So the um, so we it's not it's not launched yet. So from the perspective of the cluster, it's not something we're seeing from a performance point of view. But um, we're working with them from the development point of view, and we're working through issues that might cause problems when it launches. Um, so right now we're working through all of those issues. So we're hoping that we're not going to have any issues when it actually launches. Um, so far, it, none of the problems seem insurmountable, so it's, it's looking like it'll be perfect for launch when it comes. I think we're out of time. Actually. Are we out of time? We had five minutes five minutes ago. Oh, so. okay. It's currently 1020? Yep. All right. You guys are awesome. Oh. 30 seconds. Thanks. 30, 30, seconds. 30 seconds. I can't describe so, yeah. the problem in 30 seconds. So if anybody seconds. has any questions <laughs> that we weren't able to get to, again, in IRC, Wikimedia-operations, we're all always in there. So you can go in there and, and hunt us down and ask us questions in there as well. Except not during Wikimania yeah, as much. Well, yeah, you can go in there <laughs> now and ask Mark questions. Yeah. He would yeah. love that. Yeah. And, and if you're interested in more operations-related things or the development process and how we actually move things from testing to production and how everyone can help with that, um, there's a talk later today about Wikimedia Labs and the state of our open infrastructure. I wanted to con congratulate on the banners about how efficient you are. And we're out of time. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>